Welcome to the Biblical Quests, a worldwide scriptures study community seeking to fulfill Yah's commandment to his followers to meditate on the Torah day and night so that we may be like a tree planted by streams of water that gives its fruit in its season and that all we do will prosper. This is week 46 of our 52 week cycle of chronological reading through the Torah, prophets, and Yeshua's words. The readings and open discussion will explore several sources, in particular the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Septuagint, and Hebrew English Masoretic. Where relevant, we will also explore extra canonical books as found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. We are humbled and excited to share this journey with you all. Let us pray. Father Yah, we pray that you may speak through us that you may be with us, and may your spirit be upon us. Father, we ask that you be glorified in all that we do, that your words reign true, and what we discover, what we uncover, and what we seek out, that you may guide and bring us wisdom. We ask these things in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Week 46 portions are going to be Deuteronomy chapter 13 through 16, Micah chapter 6 through 7, Nahum chapter 1 through 3, and Yeshua portion, John chapter 13 through chapter 14. We are going to be reading one chapter at a time. At the end of each chapter, Rob and I will have a short discussion regarding topics that caught our attention and inspired us. At the end of all the readings, we are going to open the floor and have a discussion, and we are looking forward to getting your insights also on the portions today. Deuteronomy 13. If a prophet stands up in your midst or a dreamer of dreams and he gives to you a sign or wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes about that he spoke to you, saying, Let us go after other gods, those whom you have not known, and let us serve them. You must not listen to the words of that prophet or to that dreamer, for Yahweh your God is testing you to know whether you love Yahweh your God with all of your heart and with all of your inner self. You shall go after Yahweh your God, and him you shall revere, and his commandment you shall keep, and to his voice you shall listen, and him you shall serve, and to him you shall hold fast. But that prophet or the dreamer of that dream shall be executed, for he spoke falsely about Yahweh your God, the one bringing you out from the land of Egypt and the one redeeming you from the house of slavery, in order to seduce you from the way that Yahweh your God commanded you to go in it, so in this way you shall purge the evil from your midst. If your brother, the son of your mother or your son or your daughter or your wife whom you embrace or your intimate friend in secrecy says, Let us go and let us serve other gods that you and your ancestors have not known. From among the gods of the people who are around you, those near you or those far from you, from one end of the earth and up to the other end of the earth. You must not give in to him, and you shall not listen to him, and your eye shall not take pity on him, and you shall not have compassion, and you shall not cover up for him. But you shall certainly kill him, your hand shall be first against him to kill him and next the hand of all of the people. And you shall stone him with stones and let him die, for he tried to seduce you from Yahweh your God, the one bringing you from the land of Egypt, from the house of slavery. And all of Israel shall hear, and they shall fear, and they shall not continue to act according to this evil thing in your midst. If you hear in one of your towns which Yahweh your God is giving to you to live in, someone saying that worthless men have gone out from your midst and have seduced the inhabitants of their town, saying, Let us go and serve other gods, whom you have not known. Then you shall inquire and examine and interrogate thoroughly, and, look, it is true, the thing has actually been done, this detestable thing in your midst. Then you shall certainly strike down the inhabitants of that town with the edge of the sword, you shall destroy it and everything in it, its domestic animals with the edge of the sword. 
And then you shall gather all of its booty into the middle of its public square, and you shall burn the town and all of its war booty totally for Yahweh your God, and it shall be a pile of rubble forever, it shall not be built again. And let not something cling to your hand from the things devoted to destruction, so that Yahweh may turn back from his burning anger, and he may show compassion to you and he may continue to show compassion and so multiply you just as he swore to your ancestors. If you listen to the voice of Yahweh your God, to keep all of his commandments that I am commanding to you today so as to do the right thing in the eyes of Yahweh your God. Okay, chapter 13, thoughts and insights for that. First, I want to bring up and talk about the test. Many people will use Deuteronomy 13 test is what they call it against a prophet. And I'll read it here in the Septuagint. Chapter 13, verse 1 is actually... I think chapter 12, the last verse in the Masoretic. But it says here, Every word that I command you this day, you shall observe to do, and you shall not add to it, nor diminish from it. Now when reading Deuteronomy 13 and 1 John, we see that if anyone teaches that Yahweh's commandments have been diminished, abolished and or done away with he is a liar and the truth is not in him we see in first john 2 3 and by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments the one who says i have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in this person but whoever keeps his word truly in this person the love of Yah has been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says that he resides in him ought also to walk just as he walked. So the, keeping the commandments is pretty clear. John's talking about this. If we are keeping them, then, the, then we are in him and we must walk as he walked so when you take both of these aspects of walking as Yeshua walked and following the commands we see the entire how would you say the entire Torah being worked out in better understanding so I wanted to point out that diminishing or adding to it is obviously something that we're told not to do and we see many religions out there doing such a thing so keep this in mind and uh, dig deeper into this if you don't quite understand that if you're listening next one I want to talk about is te the test so test the one who gives you a sign or wonder and says let us go after other Elohims which you have not known and let us serve them so in Deuteronomy 13 3 the second part of the verse for Yahweh your Elohim is testing you to know whether you love Yahweh or Elo your Elohim with all your heart and with all your soul you shall walk after Yahweh your Elohim and you shall serve him and listen to his voice and cling to him and fear him and keep his commandments so we understand Yah is testing us all. These false prophets come, the situations come in our lives, anything that is going to draw us or pull us away from the truth, away from his word, away from his Torah, we see as a test. He wants to know if we're going to serve him, if we're going to listen, if we're going to hold tight to him, and if we're going to fear him to do his commandments and be obedient. And we see what is that how do you describe all of that and so in the next few verses i think i can get to that so deuteronomy 32 4 b for all his ways are right rulings an l of truth and without unrighteousness righteous and straight is he first samuel 12 24 only fear yahweh and you shall serve him in truth with all your heart we see that once again first kings 2 4 so that Yahweh does establish his word, which he spoke concerning me, saying, 
if your sons guard their way to walk before me in truth with all their hearts and with all their being, saying, There is not to cease a man of yours on the throne of Israel. That was David instructing Solomon in that verse. Nehemiah 9.13, And you came down on Mount Sinai and spoke with them from the heavens and gave them straight right rulings and tarot of truth. That's instructions, plural, of truth. Good laws and commands. Psalm 96.13, At the presence of Yahweh, for he shall come, for he shall come to judge the earth. He judges the world in righteousness and the peoples with his truth. So what is truth? Okay, so all of these verses is talking about El of truth, serve him with truth, and walk before him in truth. So Psalm 119, 142, your righteousness is righteousness forever and your Torah is truth. That answers it there. John 8, 31 to 32. So Yeshua said to those Yehudim who believed him, if you stay in my word, you are truly my taught ones and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So staying in his words, and we all know he glorified the Father. He walked out the Torah in obedience. And so that is the truth. And James 125 talks about the Torah. But he that looked into the perfect Torah, that of freedom, and continues in it, not becoming a hearer that forgets, many do that, but a doer of work. This one shall be blessed in his doing of the Torah. So, Yah is testing us to see if we are going to follow the truth, live it, walk it out, seek it, desire it, and cling to it. So that's what I wanted to pull together on testing the prophet, the people that are telling you many great things and wonders and signs, etc. You got to test and know. Is this person supporting the Torah, the truth, and Yeshua's words, and his ways? That's the test. Okay, next is test the one who gives you a sign or wonder and says, let us go after Elohims which you have not known and let us serve them. So back on this topic once again. So here... We're going to talk about testing the spirits in reference to the person who gives signs and wonders. So in 1 John 4, 1 through 6, we're going to see here the spirit of truth and the spirit of delusion. Beloved ones, do not believe every spirit, but prove the spirits, whether they are of Elohim, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. We just read about them. But this, you will know the spirit of Elohim, every spirit that confesses that Yeshua, Messiah, has come in the flesh, is of Elohim. And every spirit that does not confess that Yeshua, Messiah, has come in the flesh, is not of Elohim. And this is the spirit of the anti-Messiah, which you heard is coming, and now is already in the world. You are of Elohim, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. We are of Elohim. The one knowing Elohim hears us. He who is not of Elohim does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of delusion. So we see here, overcoming. We must overcome. And that is what's key. The people in the world, they only hear what the world, they can only hear what the world speaks and tells them. And those of Elohim will hear, will hear us, who is speaking and walking in the spirit of truth and not spirit of delusion. Second Peter 3.17 you then, beloved ones, being forewarned, watch, test, you also, lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the delusion of the lawless. 
Jude one eleven. Woe to them, because they have gone in the way of Cain, and gave themselves to the delusion of Balaam for a reward, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. Second Peter two eighteen nineteen, for speaking arrog- arrogant nonsense, they entice through the lusts of the flesh, through ind- indecencies, the ones who have indeed escaped from those living in delusion, promising them freedom, though themselves being slaves of corruption, for one is a slave to whatever overcomes him. Second Thessalonians 2, 9 through 12. And the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs and wonders of falsehood and with all deceit of unrighteousness in those perishing because they did not receive the love of the truth in order for them to be saved. And for this reason, Elohim sends them a working delusion for them to believe the falsehood in order that all should be judged who did not believe the truth but have delighted in unrighteousness. So to add to the truth, the, those of us must be seeking the and having the love of the truth. It's just not n- having knowledge. It's having the love of the truth, seeking it out, and actually doing it and being obedient. So that is what I wanted to put together on the test. I believe that we need to test all the things that we hear, all the things that we experience from others, even us here. Test them out and put it up against the love of the truth and what the truth is. So the verse that caught my attention is verse 4. And it caught my attention, first of all, because of the variance that I saw between the Masoretic, the DSS, and the LXX. So I wanted to outline the changes that I saw. So in the Masoretic, in, in all versions, Moses starts with love Yahweh your God with all of your heart and with all of your inner self. And then he goes on to explain what he means. So in the Masoretic, he outlines what it means to love Yahweh with your heart, with your, all of your heart and with all of your inner self. So he starts with walk after Yahweh, revere him, keep his commandments, listen to or obey him, serve him, Hold fast or cling to him. Literally in Hebrew is glue yourself to him. So walk after Yahweh is devotion, revere, a combination of awe and fear. That's reverence. Keep his commandment is obedience. Listen or obey him, obedience. Serve him from a place of faith, not from a place of expecting a reward. That's servitude. And hold on. Hold fast to him or cling to him is devotion. So then I looked at the DSS and DSS starts again with devotion, but then mixes the the terms. So we have devotion, then servitude, obedience, devotion, reverence, obedience. I was just fascinated by how they changed the order of things. And the LXX went a little bit short. It's missing the servitude, but it does include the devotion, reverence, and obedience, but missing the two references for the obedience. I just, I spent hours meditating on it. It just, it inspired me and triggered my curiosity here. So when we read verses 3 and 4 again once we see the different elements of loving Yah with all of our heart and inner self then it goes like this you must not listen to the words of that prophet or to that dreamer for Yahweh your God is testing you to know whether you love Yahweh your God with all your heart and with all your inner self you shall Walk after Yahweh your God, devotion, and him you shall revere, reverence, and his commandment you shall keep, obedience, and to his voice you shall listen, obedience, and him you shall serve, servitude, and to him you shall hold fast, devotion. The question is then, how does following Yah answer every other choice to be made? 
If you follow Yah, He will lead you in the right direction every time. The choice is no longer left up to you, but up to Yah to be made. If you believe in and fear Yah, then you must also make a choice. How much are you willing to trust and obey Yah? Obedience. Are you willing to serve Yah with everything that is in you? Hold on to Yah with all that is within you. Devotion. Are you willing to live a life in service to Yah? Servitude. Okay. Chapter... Oh, before we go to chapter 14, Jason made a comment and I agree with him. That's that caught my attention Verse also six. so I'm going back here so you can see that we color coded the variants that we see between the different versions and Jason noted that in DSS you can see in the DSS we have father mentioned and in the LXX father is mentioned but then it's not mentioned in Hebrew it's not mentioned in the Masoretic. My thought is that maybe because the rabbi, we all know that the rabbis are very focused and devoted to disqualify Yeshua in any possible way. And one of the ways is to deviate from the father lineage in the Torah and establish a mother lineage instead. So I think maybe that's why they drop the father in these verses just to establish and give more credence to the father lineage rather than mother. That's possible. Uh, to, to the mother lineage rather than father, I'm sorry. Anyway, sorry. So we can continue with chapter 14. Okay, Deuteronomy chapter 14. You are children of Yahweh your God, therefore you must not gash yourself, and you must not make your forehead bald for the dead. For you are a people holy to Yahweh your God, and you Yahweh has chosen to be a treasured possession from among all of the peoples that are on the surface of the earth. You shall not eat any detestable thing. These are the animals you may eat, ox, sheep, goats, Deer, gazelle, roebuck, wild goat, ibex, antelope, and mountain sheep. And any animal having a split hoof and so a dividing of the hoof into two parts and that choose the cud among the animals that animal you may eat. Only these you may not eat from those chewing the cud and from those having a division of the hoof, the camel and the hare and the coney, because they chew the cud, but they do not divide the hoof, they are therefore unclean for you. And also the pig because it has a division of the hoof but does not chew the cud, it is unclean for you, from their meat you shall not eat, and you shall not touch their carcasses. This is what you shall eat from all that is in the water, everything that has fins and scales you may eat. But anything that does not have fins and scales, you may not eat, for it is unclean for you. All of the birds that are clean you may eat. Now these are the ones you shall not eat any of them, the eagle and the vulture and the short-toed eagle, and the red kite and the black kite or any kind of falcon, and any kind of crow according to its kind, and the ostrich and the short-eared owl and the seagull and the hawk according to its kind, the little owl and the great owl and the barn owl, and the desert owl and the carrion vulture and the cormorant, and the stork and the heron according to its kind and the hoopoe and the bat, and also all of the winged insects, they are unclean for you, you shall not eat them. You may eat any clean bird. You shall not eat any carcass, you may give it to the alien who is in your towns, and he may eat it, or you may sell it to a foreigner, for you are a holy people for Yahweh your God, you may not boil a kid in its mother's milk. Certainly you must give a tithe of all the yield of your seed, which comes forth from your field year after year. And you shall eat before Yahweh your God in the place that he will choose to make to dwell his name there the tithe of your grain, your wine, and your olive oil and the firstling of your herd and your flock, so that you may learn to revere Yahweh your God always. But if the distance is too great for you, so that you are not able to transport it, because the place that Yahweh your God will choose to set his name there, it is too far from you, 
when Yahweh your God will bless you. Then in that case you may exchange for money, and you shall take the money to your hand and go to the place that Yahweh your God will choose. You may spend the money for anything that you desire, for oxen or for sheep or for wine or for strong drink or for anything that you desire, and you shall eat it there before Yahweh your God, and you shall rejoice, you and your household. And as to the Levite who is in your towns, you shall not neglect him, because there is not a plot of ground for him and an inheritance along with you. At the end of three years you shall bring out all of the tithe of your yield for that year, and you shall store it in your towns. And so the Levite may come because there is no plot of ground for him or an inheritance with you, and the alien also may come and the orphan and the widow that are in your towns, and they may eat their fill, so that Yahweh your God may bless you in all of the work of your hand that you undertake. Okay, so in chapter 14, verse 1, Moses reminds the Israelites of their unique relationship with Yah being referred to as the sons of the Most High implies that Yah is their father and because of this they have a special relationship with him. Yah has adopted them and, he, and as his own children and thus he is their father as well as their God. As such Israel's life was not to reflect the life of the surrounding nations Rather, Israel's life was to be in accordance with the requirements of their father, Yahweh. On the basis of this relationship, Moses issues a twofold command to Israel. The first command states, You shall not cut yourself. The verb to cut oneself, Hebrew, Gadad, means to make incisions on oneself. Here it refers to ritual cutting. This practice was prevalent in the ancient Near East, especially in the land of Canaan, where people would cut themselves to manipulate the gods to make them act in their favor. For instance, the book of First Kings tells us that the Canaanite prophets tried to manipulate the Canaanite god when they called on the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, Oh Baal, answer us. But because there was no answer from Baal, the pagan prophets then cried with a loud voice and cut themselves according to their custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out of them. To treat Yah as though he can be coerced into doing their will is to treat him like an idol. The second command forbids them from shaving their forehead for the sake of the dead. The Hebrew text literally reads, You shall not make a baldness between your eyes for the dead. To shave the forehead meant to remove the hair in the front of the head. This shaving of the forehead was also a common ancient Near Eastern pagan practice for people who mourned the death of a loved one. The general belief was that the shadow of the deceased watched those who mourned to make sure they lamented enough for him here. Thus the bereaved would make a baldness to show to the dead person that they cared for him here. The practice of cutting the body and shaving the forehead were prohibited in Israel not only because of pagan associations but also because the Israelites were to be set apart and consecrated to Yahweh. Dietary rules were given right after Moses reiterated for you are people holy to Yahweh your God and you, yeah, and Yahweh has chosen, and you, Yahweh has chosen to be a treasured possession from among all of the people that are on the surface of the earth. So, as part of being set apart and being a, tre a treasured possession of Yah, we are supposed to abstain from eating a long list of animals. One thought that came to me and I wanted to share with all of you and when we open the floor for discussion, I would love to get insights from you, is regarding verses 19 and 20. So, 
if I translate it literally from Hebrew, verse 19 says, all birds or fowl that is flightless, meaning cannot fly, it's winged but it, can, but it doesn't fly, are unclean to you. You shall not eat them. And verse 20 says, you shall eat every clean bird or fowl. I find it interesting that the English version conveniently translate verse 19 instead of birds or fowl to insects, while the same word in verse 20 gets translated to bird. Verse 19 literally refers to flightless birds. It evokes questions in my mind regarding chickens and also turkey. Chickens were not mentioned in the Hebrew Bible, not even once. Chickens are winged birds that are essential, essentially flightless. Are we supposed to eat them? Are they clean? Okay, and I want to speak to the tithe in Deuteronomy 14. We read here about the tithe in Jubilees 32.10. And for this reason, it is ordained in the heavenly tablets as a law for the tithing again, the tithe to eat before Yahweh from year to year in the place where it is chosen, that his name should dwell. So we know the word for tithing is like tenths. So it's one tenth. And in this verse, we see that the place that is chosen to give your tithe is in, a, is in a place his name should dwell. And that's why we see through many of the temple times, it's always been a temple. It's always been that where the tithes would go to and be offered. So I just want to touch on that point with the tenths or the tithe of where, always where his name should dwell. That's really the answer there. And then I want, I want to speak to in Matthew 23, 23, woe to you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you tithe the mint and the anise and the acumen and have neglected the weightier matters of the Torah, the right ruling and the compassion and the belief, these need to have been done without neglecting the others. So we see another comment on tithe mentioned in Matthew from Yeshua. And what I wanted to point out here is they're doing a tithe, which is fine. He's Yeshua literally says here, these need to have been done without neglecting the other things. Neglecting the other things would be the tithe and so forth of what they do, but they weren't doing they weren't doing the right rulings, which is justice, making the right calls and doing the right things. And then the compassion. The compassion comes in for the in the example of your donkeys in the ditch on a Shabbat. Do you help it or you let it just die or we see Yeshua healing on the Sabbath so he's pointing that out where's the compassion where's the right rulings and the belief is it just creating a religion where's your belief in the Father and knowing that he is just and he is compassionate and they just lost that so I also want to point out regarding tithing and giving in Sirach 35, 9 through 10, give to the Most High as he has given to you, generously, according to your means. He who gives to the poor makes Yahweh his debtor. Who is the source of recompenses, if not he? For Elohim is the one who always repays, and he will give back to you sevenfold. So, once again, we're giving, we're helping, we're donating, we're giving our time, our money, etc. to the poor, to those in need. Yahweh will pay us back sevenfold. Whether it's here or whether it's in the kingdom, it's going to happen. He says so. And let us not worry about that. I know many people talk about that with giving to the poor. Oh, they're going to use it for alcohol, this or that, etc. It's hard for us to judge and make that call. We don't know. And it's hard to just judge someone on their appearance. To do. But if we give with a cheerful heart, he will repay. And it'll also repay the person who is in deceit too. So keep that in mind. But at the same time, it's tricky. We, 
we want to give without an expectation of being repaid. Oh, no. Yeah, absolutely. I'm just reading from the verse here that Yahweh repays, and not only for the positive, but also for the bad. So keep that in mind, too. So he repays. Deuteronomy chapter 15. At the end of seven years you shall grant a remission of debt. And this is the manner of the remission of debt. Every creditor shall remit his claim that he holds against his neighbor and he shall not exact payment from his brother because there a remission of debt has been proclaimed unto Yahweh. With respect to the foreigner you may exact payment, but you must remit what shall be owed to you with respect to your brother. Nevertheless, there shall not be among you a poor person, because Yahweh will certainly bless you in the land that Yahweh your God is giving to you as an inheritance, to take possession of it. If only you listen well to the voice of Yahweh your God by observing diligently all of these commandments that I am commanding you today. When Yahweh your God has blessed you, just as he promised to you, then you will lend to many nations, but you will not borrow from them, and you will rule over many nations, but they will not rule over you. If there is a poor person among you from among one of your brothers in one of your towns that Yahweh your God is giving to you, you shall not harden your heart and you shall not shut your hand toward your brother who is poor. But you shall certainly open your hand for him, and you shall willingly lend to him enough to meet his need, whatever it is. Take care so that there will not be a thought of wickedness in your heart, saying, The seventh year, the year of the remission of debt is near, and you view your needy neighbor with hostility, and so you do not give to him, and he might cry out against you to Yahweh, and you would incur guilt against yourself. By all means you must give to him, and you must not be discontented at your giving to him, because on account of this very thing, Yahweh your God will bless you in all your work and in all that you undertake. For the poor will not cease to be among you in the land, therefore I am commanding you, saying, You shall willingly open your hand to your brother, to your needy and to your poor that are in your land. If your relative who is a Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman is sold to you, and he or she has served you six years, then in the seventh year you shall send that person out free. And when you send him out free from you, you shall not send him away empty-handed. You shall generously supply him from among your flocks and from your threshing floor and from your press, according to that with which Yahweh your God has blessed you, you shall give to him. And remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt and Yahweh your God redeemed you, therefore I am commanding you thus today. And then if it will happen that he says to you, I do not want to go out from you, because he loves you and your family, because it is good for him to be with you. Then you shall take an awl, and you shall thrust it through his earlobe and into the door, and he shall be to you a slave forever, and you shall also do likewise for your slave woman. It shall not be hard in your eyes when you send him forth free, because for six years he has served you worth twice the wage of a hired worker, and Yahweh your God will bless you in whatever you will do. Every firstling male that is born of your herd and of your flock you shall consecrate to Yahweh your God, you shall not do work with the firstling of your ox, and you shall not shear the firstling of your flock. Rather before Yahweh your God you shall eat it year by year at the place Yahweh will choose, you and your household. But if there is a physical defect in it, such as lameness or blindness, any serious defect, you shall not sacrifice it to Yahweh your God. In your towns you shall eat it, the unclean and the clean together may eat it, just as they eat the gazelle and as they eat the deer. But you shall not eat its blood, you shall pour it on the ground like water. Okay, so I didn't have many comments on chapter 15 as it's probably one of my least favorite chapters in the Torah and again when we open the floor I would love to get feedback from anyone that can put my mind at peace regarding the fact that slavery is endorsed by Yah in this chapter he is commanding us to have more compassion and more fairness towards slaves, but still it's endorsed, it's not forbidden, and that's something that has always bothered me. Yeah, what I understand about the slavery part is that it's more like a serv- servant, would, like 
in our time would be like a maid or a butler or an assistant, that type of thing, like personal assistant to in your home, your property, etc. That can be you can be used in many different ways. And we also read in the Torah that when a person was in in servitude, whether for some debt or some means, was that you were to treat them very well and very good. So they weren't abused. That was the proper way of Yah's instructions. So if a person became into debt and became had to fall under servitude too, you were not to treat them in any negative way, but treat them as a, a brother or sister on your property, in your home, etc. So it was much positive on that side of it. Something else I wanted to point out, that verse 11, it, it literally is a commandment to help the poor, the needy, your brothers who are poor and needy that are always going to be around. So I just want to point that out. It is a command that Yah gives us. And then lastly, you know, I'll end it with that. And we'll move on to the next chapter. Deuteronomy chapter 16. Observe the month of Aviv, and you shall keep the Passover to Yahweh your God. For in the month of Aviv Yahweh your God brought you out from Egypt by night. And you shall offer the Passover sacrifice to Yahweh your God from among your flock and herd at the place that Yahweh will choose, to let his name dwell there. You shall not eat with it anything leavened, seven days you shall eat with it unleavened bread of affliction, because in haste you went out from the land of Egypt, so that you will remember the day of your going out from the land of Egypt all the days of your life. And leaven shall not be seen with you in any of your territory for seven days, and none of the meat that you will slaughter on the evening on the first day shall remain overnight until morning. You are not allowed to offer the Passover sacrifice in one of your towns that Yahweh your God is giving to you, but only at the place that Yahweh your God will choose to let his name dwell there, you shall offer the Passover sacrifice in the evening at sunset, at the designated time of your going out from Egypt. And you shall cook, and you shall eat it at the place that Yahweh your God will choose, and you may turn in the morning and go to your tents. Six days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be an assembly for Yahweh your God, you shall not do work. You shall count off seven weeks for you, from the time you begin to harvest the standing grain you shall begin to count seven weeks. And then you shall celebrate the Feast of Weeks for Yahweh your God with the measure of the free will offering of your hand that you shall give just as Yahweh your God has blessed you. And you shall rejoice before Yahweh your God, you and your son and your daughter and your slave woman and the Levite that is in your towns and the alien and the orphan and the widow who are in your midst in the place that Yahweh your God will choose to let his name dwell there. And you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt, and so you shall diligently observe these rules. You shall celebrate the Feast of Booths for yourselves seven days at the gathering in of the produce from your threshing floor and from your press. And you shall rejoice at your feast, you and your son and your daughter and your slave woman and the Levite and the alien and the orphan and the widow that are in your towns. Seven days you shall celebrate your feast to Yahweh your God at the place Yahweh will choose. For Yahweh your God shall bless you in all of your produce and in all of the work of your hand, and you shall surely be rejoicing. Three times in the year all of your males shall appear before Yahweh your God at the place that he will choose, at the Feast of Unleavened Bread and at the Feast of Weeks and at the Feast of Booths, and they shall not appear before Yahweh empty-handed. Each person shall give as he is able, that is, according to the blessing of Yahweh your God that he has given to you. You shall appoint judges and officials for you in all your towns that Yahweh your God is giving to you throughout your tribes, and you shall render for the people righteous judgments. You shall not subvert justice, you shall not show partiality, and you shall not take a bribe, for the bribe makes blind the eyes of the wise and misrepresents the words of the righteous. Justice, only justice you shall pursue, so that you may live and you shall take possession of the land that Yahweh your God is giving to you. You shall not plant for yourselves an Asherah pole beside the altar of Yahweh your God that you make for yourselves. And you shall not set up for yourselves a stone pillar, a thing that Yahweh your God hates. Thoughts and insights on chapter 16. Okay, so before we go into the slides, I just I wanted to make a comment about two words that are used in Hebrew. Uh, one of them is ger, 
and I talked about it in the presentation that we prepared, the introduction presentation for this series. Ger, Gimel Resh, Ger, G-A-E-R, okay? Ger actually meant a convert, but not like a formally rabbinical converted person, just people that decided that they were fascinated with the Hebrews and their culture and religion and they would attach themselves to the Hebrews by moving, physically moving into their geographical location and following the same set of commandments. So those were considered ger, okay? And then there is nochri, which means a foreigner or a stranger. What I noticed in the English translation, they keep mixing between all of them and alien and stranger and many times referred to girl. So whenever I see those different, those terms used, I am going to denote them in color. You can tell whether it's really a convert or just a stranger. And in, in verse 14, is it a convert? So in verse 14, it's a convert, ger, in Hebrew. And I think that's a, very important because a, the word stranger we would take as someone who is not of like us, where a convert is someone who was not like us but now converted to our faith. Yeah. I think that's a, it means there's a big difference between the meanings. Yes. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. And then the second comment I had was on verse 8, we also had, between the three versions, we had variants. In DSS, DSS uh, is talking about is that we will eat unleavened bread for seven days. However, LXX and Masoretic say six days. Honestly, I don't know how significant it is, but I don't know. I know in Israel we keep seven days. We eat unleavened bread for seven days. I, I don't know what else to say about it other than it's really interesting that one day is missing in the Masoretic and LXX. Yep. Okay, so insight. So Deuteronomy 16.21. Remember that time when Jews used to worship three goddess, a tree goddess? No, I do. Her name was Asherah, and she was a tree. Asherah is arguably the most important goddess in the Canaanite pantheon, the prototypical mother of gods and humans, and consort of the chief god El. And by him, she was the mother of 70 gods interesting. She is also the mistress of the sea and the land and protector of all living things. Known also as Astarte, Ishtar, and the Queen of Heaven. She was widely worshipped throughout Syria and Canaan. She was frequently paired with Baal, who was her son, by the way, who often took the place of El, as Baal's consort, Asherah, was usually given the name Baalat. In Hebrew, the word Asherah is derived from the root Osher, literally meaning joy, bliss, or immense delight. I'll circle back to this in a moment. Asherah was represented by a limbless tree trunk planted in the ground, the trunk was usually carved into a symbolic representation of the goddess. Because of the association with carved trees, the places of Asherah worship were commonly called groves, and the Hebrew word Asherah, well, Asherim, could refer either to the goddess or to a grove of trees. Her son Baal on the other hand, was represented as a stone pillar. What could she have meant to the people of monotheistic ancient Israel? Asherah was known from the immense library of 13th century cuneiform tablets found in Syria at the site of Ugarit. But there are also more than 40 direct and indirect references to Asherah in the Hebrew Bible, always in negative terms. 
Most references are indirect to the Asherah poles that symbolized her by a number of them, but a number of them clearly refer directly to the goddess Asherah. We first get reference to Asherah in the book of Exodus, but the clearest biblical statement about her is from Deuteronomy 16:21. You shall not plant for yourself an Asherah beside the altar of Yahweh, your God, that you make for yourself. Another clear statement about her is from Deuteronomy 12, 2 through 5. You must completely demolish all of the places there where they serve their gods, that is, the nations whom you are about to dispossess on the high mountain and on the hills and under each leafy green tree and you shall break down their altars and you shall smash their stone pillars and their asherah you must burn with fire and the images of their gods you shall hew down and you shall blot out their names from that place you shall not worship yahweh your god like this but only to the place that Yahweh your God will choose from all your tribes to place his name there as his dwelling shall you seek, and there you shall go. And yet another decisive reference from Judges 6.25-26 through 26, in case we miss the previous memos. Now on that same night Yahweh said to him, Gideon, Take the bull of the cattle that belongs to your father, and a second bull, seven years old, and pull down the altar of Baal that belongs to your father, and cut down the Asherah that is beside it, and build an altar to Yahweh your God on the top of this stronghold in the proper arrangement, and take a second bull and offer it as a burnt offering with the wood of the Asherah that you will cut down. Despite Yah's clear instructions, however, Asherah worship was a perennial problem in Israel. As Solomon slipped into idolatry, one of the pagan deities he brought into the kingdom was Asherah, called the goddess of the Sidonians. Later, Jezebel made Asherah worship even more prevalent with 400 prophets of Asherah on the royal payroll. Jeremiah 44, 15 through 23 is very revealing too. Then all the men who knew that their wives were making smoke offerings to other gods and all the women who stood by a great assembly and all the people who lived in the land of Egypt in Patros answered Jeremiah saying, Concerning the word that you have spoken to us in the name of Yahweh, we are not going to listen to you. But certainly we will do everything that went out from our mouth to make smoke offerings to the Queen of Heaven, Asherah, and to pour out to her libations just as we did, we and our ancestors, our kings and our officials in the towns of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. For then we had enough to eat and we were well off and we did not see disaster. But since we stopped making smoke offering to the Queen of Heaven and pouring out libations to her, we have lacked everything, and by the sword and by the famine we have perished. And indeed, when we were making smoke offerings to the Queen of Ev Heaven and pouring out to her libations, was it not with the consent of our husbands that we met for her sac sacrificial cakes? marked with her image and we poured out to her libations then jeremiah said to all the people to the men and to the women and to all the people who answered him a word saying the smoke offerings that you made in the towns of judah and in the streets of jerusalem you and your ancestors 
your kings and your officials and the people of the land, did not Yahweh remember them? And did it not come to his mind? And Yahweh was no longer able to bear it because of the evil of your deeds, because of the testable thing that you committed. Thus your land became as a site of ruins and as a horror and as a curse without inhabitants, as it is this day, because of the fact that you made smoke offerings and that you sinned against Yahweh and you did not listen to the voice of Yahweh and you have not walked in his law and in his statutes and in his legal provisions. Therefore, this disaster has happened to you as it is this day. Notice that I use the same color combination from before with the obedience, reverence, and devotion. At times, Israel experienced revival and notable crusade against Asherah worship were led by Gideon and later by King Josiah. But all in all, it seemed like a lost cause to uproot her worship from within the hearts of his stiff-necked children. Curiouser and curiouser, inscriptions from two locations in southern Canaan seem to indicate that she was also worshipped as the consort of Yahweh. This inscription specifically referred to Yahweh and his Asherah. In other words, as the pagan El was replaced with the holy El, the people concluded that Yah had a wife named Asherah. This corrupt blending of a holy god with a pagan goddess became part of everyday religious practice. For an Asherah Paul even stood in front of Solomon's temple for most of its existence, as well as in Yahweh's sanctuary in Samaria. There is also much extra biblical evidence of Asherah in Israel from the time of the judges right through monarchical times, including in paintings, drawings, pendants, plaques, pottery, clay pillar figurines, cult stands, and inscriptions. And even more curious there, in Proverbs 1, 20 through 33, and Proverbs 8, 1 through 9, 12, Wisdom is personified as a woman who has much to offer, including enduring wealth and prosperity and life to anyone who would heed her words. Is it possible that the wisdom King Solomon referred to in these passages is none other than Asherah? Some scholars suggest just that. Consider this. Solomon ignored Yahweh's warning by building temples in honor of his wife's native gods throughout Jerusalem, as is written in 1 Kings 11.4. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of David his father had been. By building and dedicating these temples, it was Solomon himself that brought the worship of Asherah out of the countryside and into the capital city of Jerusalem. Excerpts from Proverbs 8. When he established the heaven, I was there. When he marked out the foundation of the earth, then I was beside him, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him, always rejoicing in his inhabited world and delighting in the children of men. This takes us back to the meaning of Asherah, Queen of Heaven, Consort of El in Hebrew. As you recall, in Hebrew, the word Asherah is derived from the root Osher, literally meaning joy, bliss, immense delight. And on the way opens a Pandora box of questions for us to ponder. But that's a rabbit hole I'm not ready to jump into 
at least not yet. That is the end of Deuteronomy reading. And I will say in chapter 16, the one thing that also rang a bell to me was justice you shall pursue. So once again, talking about justice and right rulings. So with the Torah reading done, we shall move into the prophets. Micah chapter 6. Hear now what Yahweh says. Arise, plead your case with the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, O mountains, the indictment of Yahweh, and you eternal foundations of the earth. For Yahweh has an indictment against his people, and against Israel he contends. O my people, what have I done to you? And how have I wearied you? Answer me. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt, and from the house of slavery I redeemed you. And I sent Moses, Aaron, and Miriam before you. O my people, remember what Balak the king of Moab devised, and what Balaam the son of Beer answered him, and what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, so that you might know the righteous acts of Yahweh. With what shall I approach Yahweh, and bow down to God on high? Shall I approach him with burnt offerings, with bull calves a year old? Will Yahweh be pleased with thousands of rams, with myriads of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does Yahweh ask from you, but to do justice, and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? The voice of Yahweh calls to the city. It is sound judgment to fear your name. Hear, O staff. Now who has appointed it? Is there any longer a man in the house of the wicked? Treasures of wickedness. And the ephah of scarcity which is accursed. Shall I regard as pure the one with scales of wickedness? And with a bag of deceitful weights? Because her rich are full of violence and her inhabitants speak lies, and their tongue is deceitful in their mouth. And I also have made you sick by striking you down, making you desolate because of your sins. You yourself will eat but not be satisfied. Your hunger will be in your midst. And you will put away, but you will not save. And what you save I will hand over to the sword. You yourself will sow, but you will not reap. You will tread olives, but you will not anoint yourself with oil. You will tread grapes, but you will not drink wine. For you have observed the regulations of Omri, and all the works of the house of Ahab, and you have walked in their counsels, so that I am making you a desolation, and your inhabitants an object of scorn. So you will bear the scorn of my people. So in, in this chapter, I did want to point out once again, in verse 8, we see, he, he's literally telling the people here, Yah, Yahweh asks you to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly. And I just think if everybody in this world would do that, we would have such a great place in doing justice. What is right rulings, fair rulings, you know, what is right? Love kindness. Everybody was to be kind, courteous, pleasant pleasantries, etc., and then walk humbly. No pride. And that, as we know, that's the, one of the biggest issues is pride, narcissism, etc., that is out in this world. If we were just to do, to do those three things, it would be so much better. I just wanted to point the note from the DSS Bible authors. So apparently within the DSS manuscripts, there were also quite a few manuscripts that are called Peshir. In Hebrew, it means interpretation. So those were the free writing of the community in Qumran, interpreting different books. And apparently they had quite a bit of interpretation on Micah, on the book of Micah. And they interpreted the prophecies in this book as prophecies that are directed toward the Pharisees of the late Second Temple period, in particular the leadership 
who evidently sought to silence the teacher, the teacher with capital T, as mentioned in the Damascus documents and other documents in the Dead Sea Scrolls. We are going to do some side presentations on the Dead Sea Scrolls as we organize the information that we are learning right now. But it's very fascinating. They are talking about a teacher or a teacher of righteousness and it like rings, rings a bell as Yeshua. But anyway, so they believe that Micah prophecies are pointed, directed toward the Pharisees. Micah chapter 7. Woe is me, for I have become like the gatherings of summer, like the gleanings of the grape harvest, when there is no cluster of grapes to eat, or early ripened fruit that my soul desires. The faithful person has perished from the land, and there is none who is upright among humankind. All of them lie in wait for blood. Each hunts his brother with a net. Their hands are upon evil, to do it well. The official and the judge ask for the bribe, and the great man utters the evil desire of his soul, and they weave it together. The best of them is like a briar, the most upright worse than a thorn hedge. The day of your watchman, your punishment, has come. Now their confusion will come. Do not put faith in a friend. Put no trust in a close friend. Guard the doorways of your mouth. From the one who lies in your lap. For a son treats a father with contempt. A daughter rises up against her mother. A daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. The enemies of a man are the men of his own house. But as for me, I will look to Yahweh. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. You should not rejoice over me, O oh my enemy. When I fall I will stand up. When I sit in darkness, Yahweh will be a light for me. I will bear the rage of Yahweh, for I have sinned against him, until he pleads my cause, and executes my justice. He will bring me out to the light. I will see his righteousness. Then my enemy will see, and shame will cover her who said to me, Where is Yahweh your God? My eyes will look upon her. Now she will become a trampling place, like mud in the streets. A day for building your walls. On that day he will extend your boundary. On that day he will come to you. From Assyria and the cities of Egypt. And from Egypt to the river. And from sea to sea. And mountain to mountain. But the earth will be a desolation. Because of its inhabitants. For the fruit of their deeds. Shepherd your people with your staff. The flock of your inheritance those dwelling alone in a forest, in the midst of Carmel. Let them feed in Bashan and Gilead, as in the days of old, as in the days when you came out. From the land of Egypt, I will show him wondrous things. The nations will see and be ashamed, because of all their might. They will lay the hand on the mouth. Their ears will be deaf. They will lick the dust like the serpent like the crawling things of the earth. They will come trembling from their strongholds. To Yahweh our God. Let them fear and be afraid of you. Who is a God like you, forgiving sin, and passing over rebellion for the remnant of his inheritance? He does not retain his anger forever. For he delights in loyal love. He will again have compassion on us. He will trample our iniquities. And you will hurl all their sins. In the depths of the sea, you will show faithfulness to Jacob, and loyal love to Abraham, as you have sworn to our ancestors, from the days of old. Okay, thoughts on Micah chapter 6 and 7. I wanted to read here, where is your love? So, we had just read here in Micah 7, 5 through 7. Do not put faith in a friend. Put no trust in a close friend. Guard your doorways of your mouth from the one who lies in your lap. 
For a son treats a father with contempt. A daughter rises up against her mother. A daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. The enemies of a man are the men of his own house. But as for me, I will look to Yahweh. I will wait for the Elohim of my salvation. My Elohim will hear me. Okay, let's compare that with Matthew 10, 34 to 39. Do not think that I have come to bring peace on earth. I have come, I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father and a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And the enemies of a man will be the members of his household. The one who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And the one who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. The one who finds his life will lose it. And the one who loses his life because of me will find it. So we see here, Micah's talking about this, the same thing. Do not put in your faith in friends, loved ones, etc. But put it in Yahweh. And Matthew's also making that statement here. Yeshua says he, he hasn't come to bring peace but a sword. Because he's wanting to divide us in, in, in the sense that who are, we to, who are we loving? Who do we love? Who are we serving? Are we serving our children? Are we serving our family members? Are we serving the people in our home, our community? Where are we putting our time, energy, and effort in? Is it them and then Yah last or just an afterthought? So, so we see here Micah talking about that in, in his time for prophesying and then also Yeshua talking about this and telling people the Father comes first and he also says whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. So he also clarifies to walk as he walked, do as he did, so that we can serve the Father, love the Father, and his ways. And we just talked about that earlier, his ways are truth. Last thing I wanted to point, one thing I wanted to point out on Micah, in addition to that, that I thought was interesting, is that the comment of none who is up, there is none who is upright, he mentions in the beginning. And their confusion will come. So I thought that was an interesting thought about that. None is up, that all the unrighteous, the confusion will come. They just won't understand truth because of their lusts of the flesh and so forth. And then in verse 10, the trampling place. He's talking about, he's prophesying the place is becoming a trampling place. Like mud in the streets, a desolation. Whether we want to tie that into uh, the <laughs> I about uh, it mud flat so. <laughs> theories and all of that, but I thought that was a good one to that could yeah. be very easily tied into that. Yeah. The book of Nahum. The Oracle Concerning Nineveh. The scroll of the vision of Nahum the Elko's height. Yahweh is a jealous God and avenging. Yahweh is avenging and full of wrath. Yahweh takes vengeance against his enemies. He rages against his adversaries. Yahweh is slow to anger but great in power. And Yahweh will certainly not allow the guilty to go unpunished. He marches in storm wind and in gale. Storm clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and he dries up the rivers. He makes all the rivers run dry. Bashan and Carmel wither. The blossom of Lebanon languishes. Mountains quake before him. The hills shake apart. The earth heaves before him. The world and all her inhabitants. His indignation who can stand before it. Who can endure his fierce anger. His wrath is poured out like fire. Rocks are shattered before him. Yahweh is good a refuge in the day of distress. He knows those who take refuge in him. But with a rushing torrent he will bring Nineveh to an end. He will chase his enemies into darkness. What do you plot against Yahweh? He will completely destroy it. Trouble will not rise up a second time. For like entangled thorns, and like their drink which is drunk, 
they will be consumed like fully dry chaff. From you goes out one who plots evil against Yahweh. One who plans wickedness. Yahweh says this. Even though they are powerful and likewise many. Even they will be cut off and pass away. Though I have afflicted you. I will afflict you no longer. And now, I will break his yoke from upon you. I will snap your bonds. Yahweh has commanded concerning you. Your name will no longer be sown. I will cut off the idols and images from the temple of your gods. I will send you to the grave because you are worthless. Look! On the mountains! The feet of the one who brings good tidings! The one who proclaims peace! Celebrate your festivals, O Judah! Fulfill your vows! For he will not invade you again! The wicked one is cut off completely! One who shatters has come up against you! Guard the fortification! Watch the road! Gird your loins. Muster all your strength. For Yahweh will restore the majesty of Jacob. Like the majesty of Israel. For ravagers have ravaged them. And ruined their branches. The shields of his warriors are dyed red. The powerful men are dressed in scarlet. The metal of the chariots shines like fire on the day of battle. And their spears quiver. The chariots race madly through the streets. They rush back and forth in the public squares. Their appearance like lightning bolts. They dart about like flashes of lightning. He calls his officers. They stumble as they march. They rush to her wall. They set the covering in place. The gates of the river are opened. The palace trembles. Her goddess is taken out and taken into exile. Her maidservants moan like doves. They beat on their breasts. Nineveh is like a pool of water without its water. As they flee, she cries, Stop! But there is no one who turns back. Plunder the silver. Plunder the gold. There is no end to the spoils. An abundance of everything one could want. Emptiness and plundering and devastation. Their hearts faint and their knees tremble. All their loins shake and all their faces turn pale. Where now is the den of the lions? And the cave of the fierce lions? There the lioness, the cub, and the lion once prowled. And no one disturbed them. The lion tore apart enough prey for his cubs. He strangled prey for his lioness. He filled his lair with prey. And his den with mangled carcass. Look! I am against you, declares Yahweh of hosts. I will burn her chariots with fire. The sword will devour fierce lions. I will cut off your prey from the earth. The voice of your messengers will no longer be heard. Woe to the city that has shed much blood. She is a deceiver. She is filled with plunder. She has hoarded her spoils of war. The crack of the whip. The rumbling of the chariot wheel. The galloping of the horse. The racing of the chariot's charge. Swords flash. Spears glitter. Many corpses are piled high. There is no end to the slain. They stumble over their dead. Because of the many idolatries of the prostitute. The beautiful charm of a mistress of witchcraft. She who enslaves nations by her harlotries. And peoples by her sorceries. Look! I am against you, declares Yahweh of hosts. I will strip up your skirts over your face. I will let nations look at your nakedness, and kingdoms your shame. I will throw filth upon you. I will treat you with contempt. I will make you a spectacle. And it will be that everyone who sees you will flee from you. And they will say, Nineveh is destroyed. Who will mourn for her? From whence shall I seek comforters for you? Are you better than Thebes? She who sits at the Nile, surrounded by her waters. Her rampart was the sea and water was her wall. Cush was her strength, Egypt without end. Put and Libya were among your allies. Yet she went into captivity as an exile. Her children were dashed to pieces at the head of all the streets. They cast lots for her nobles. All of her dignitaries were bound with chains. You also will behave like a drunkard. 
You also will hide yourself. You also will seek refuge from the enemy. All of your fortifications are like fig trees with ripe first fruits. If they are shaken, they will fall into the mouth of the eater. Look! Your troops are like women in your midst. The gates of your land are wide open to your enemies. Fire will consume the bars of your gates. Draw water for a siege. Strengthen your fortifications. Go to the mud pit. Trample the clay. Grasp the brick mold. Their fire will consume you. The sword will cut you off. It will consume you like the locust. Multiply yourself like the locust. Multiply yourself like the grasshopper. You have increased your merchants more than the stars of heaven. Like the locust they will shed their skin and fly away. Your officials are like locusts. Your commanders are like a swarm of locusts. They encamp on the walls on a cold day. When the sun rises, they fly away. No one knows where they have gone. Your shepherds are sleeping, O king of Assyria. Your nobles slumber. Your people are scattered on the mountains. No one can gather them. There is no healing for your wound. Your injury is fatal. All who hear the report of you will clap their hands for joy concerning you. For who has not suffered at the hands of your endless cruelty? A couple of comments on whom. So I'm going back to the first chapter and reading the comment from the DSS Bible. So Nahum, late 7th century BC oracle against Nineveh, is found in three of the ten minor prophets' manuscripts and is the subject of one of the most important and extensive of the Pesher texts found in the caves at Qumran. In that Pesher, the prophecy's original setting the imminent fall of Nineveh, capital of the waning superpower of Assyria, is ignored and the prophet's words of judgment are turned against a group called seekers of smooth things or flattery seekers, as is evident from the context this designation is clearly meant to represent the Pharisees. The second comment is on Nahum verse 2. On his enemies God takes vengeance against his foes he bears a grudge. Is cited in Damascus document in conjunction with Leviticus 19.18. Take no vengeance and bear no grudge against your kinfolk to demonstrate that vengeance taken on a fellow sectarian is not proper. To deal with a fellow is in such a way would be to regard kinfolk, kinfolk as the enemy. So I just wanted to say that when I read three chapters of Nahum, what I saw in front of me is the book of Revelation. There were so many verses here that reminded me of Revelation, reminded me of the prophecies against the harlot, which I believe was Jerusalem. And when I read the, all the, the destruction here of this city, I really didn't see Nineveh. I saw Jerusalem and I saw the destruction of Jerusalem. Everything fit perfectly. Yeah, and we see a lot of cyclical things in the scriptures. So they may be talking about a specific city, and then they also will reference, how do you say, more like idioms to it, calling a harlotry, prostit the prostitute, idolatries of the prostitute, etc. That can fit many cities and many nations, because we have read in Revelation that harlot had many daughters. And so that just spans out through time and through the world. Something that I saw mentioned that in regards to Revelation was the Day of Trouble. And it talked about that where Yah will bring a flood to make an end of their place. So once again, it comes to the a flooding of, of trampled places, which definitely fit into that mud flood theory of devastation. Not, I'm not saying everything was but it's definitely mentioned in scripture so at minimum we could say this that type of event happened regionally and or many places for judgment's sake 
and also talking about the revelation, the idolatries of the prostitute, and talking about sorceries of this prostitute, and t- totally ties in with revelation that we did last year, discussing the many mm-hmm. the many things of this prostitute, and we tied into the sorceries fitting in with pharmakia being part of the sorceries that is used during that time. So I, I think it's just very interesting that was mentioned here also in, in reference to revelation, revelational language. So un- unfortunately, I didn't have a, a whole lot of time to really dig into this. I wanted to pull all my revelation stuff out to really <laughs> show pages that would relate to this, but unfortunately, I ran out of uh, in-depth time to devote that I that had I wanted. And then we got Yeshua's words next. But that's the end of the, uh, the Torah and the Prophets, so we'll move on to Yeshua's words and go from there. So Yeshua's portion, John chapter 13 through chapter 14. This is where Yeshua washes his disciples' feet. Now before the feast of Passover, Yeshua, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart from the world to the Father, And having loved his own in the world, loved them to the end. And as the dinner was taking place, when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, that he should betray him, because he knew that the Father had given him all things into his hands, and that he had come forth from God and was going away to God, he got up from the dinner and took off his outer clothing, and taking a towel, tied it around himself. Then he poured water into the wash basin and began to wash the feet of his disciples and to wipe them dry with the towel which he had tied around himself. Then he came to Simon Peter. He said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Yeshua answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now but you will understand after these things. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet forever. Yeshua replied to him, Unless I wash you, you do not have a share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. (laughs) Yeshua said to him, The one who has bathed only needs to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, But not all of you, for he knew the one who would betray him because of this. He said, not all of you are clean. So when he had washed their feet and taken his outer clothing and reclined at the table again, he said to them, do you understand what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you speak correctly, for I am. If then I, your Lord and teacher, wash your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example, that just as I have done to you, you also do. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you understand these things, you are blessed if you do them. I am not speaking about all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but in order that the scriptures will be fulfilled, the one who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. From now on, I am telling you before it happens, in order that when it happens, you may believe that I am he. Truly I say to you, the one who receives any one I send receives me. And the one who receives me receives the one who sent me. When he had said these things, Yeshua was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Truly I say to you that one of you will betray me. The disciples began looking at one another, uncertain about whom he was speaking. One of his disciples, the one whom Yeshua loved, was reclining close beside Yeshua. So Simon Peter gestured for this one to inquire who it was about whom he was speaking. He leaned back accordingly against Yeshua's chest and said to him, Lord, who is it? Yeshua replied, It is he to whom I dipped a piece of bread and give it to him. Then after dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. And after the piece of bread, then Satan entered into him. Then Yeshua said to him, What you are doing, do quickly. Now no one of these reclining at the table knew for what reason he had said this to him. 
For some were thinking because Judas had the money box, Yeshua was telling him, purchase what we need for the feast, or that we should give something to the poor. So after he had taken the piece of bread, he went out immediately, and it was night. Then when he had gone out, Yeshua said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him immediately. Children, yet a little time I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. Now I say also to you, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Yeshua replied, Where I am going you cannot follow, but you will follow later. Peter said to him, Lord, why am I not able to follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Yeshua replied, Will you lay down your life for me? Truly I say to you, the rooster will not crow until you have denied me three times. John chapter 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places, but if not, I would have told you, because I am going away to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, so that where I am you may be also, and you know the way where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How are we able to know the way? Yeshua said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. She was said to him, Am I with you so long a time, and you have not known me, Philip? The one who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak for myself, but the Father residing in me does his work. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. But if not, believe because of the works themselves. Truly I say to you, the one who believes in me, the works that I am doing, he will do also and he will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. And whatever you ask in my name, I will do this, in order that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate, in order that he may be with you forever. The Spirit of Truth, whom the world is not able to receive, because it does not see Him or know Him. You know Him, because He resides in you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I am coming to you. Yet a little time the world will see me no longer, but you will see me, because I live in you. Because I live, you also will live. On that day you will know that I am in the Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. The one who has my commandments and keeps them, and the one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will reveal myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, why is that you are going to reveal yourself to us and not to the world? Yeshua answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my father will love him, and he will come to him, and will take up residence with him. The one who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the father who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while residing with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the father will send in my name, that one will teach you all things, and will remind you of everything that I said to you. Peace, I leave with you, my peace. I give to you, not as the world gives, I give to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. You have heard that I said to you, I am going away, and I am coming to you. 
If you loved me, you would have rejoiced that I am going to the Father, because the Father is greater than I am. And now I have told you before it happens, so that when it happens, you may believe. I will no longer speak much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming, and has no <laughs> power over me. But so that the world may know that I love the Father, and just as the Father has commanded me, thus I am doing. Get up, let's go from here. Last thoughts and insights about John chapter 13 and 14. Okay, so we are closing a circle. When we designed this schedule, we didn't, we just went chronologically. And it's really miraculous every week when we do our portions, everything comes together and there is so much synergy between all the books. So this week, chants are very focused on obedience and devotion and, and reverence and loving our uh, John chapter 14, keeping Yeshua's commandments is equal to following father's words which is obedience it's also equal to loving yeshua which is the devotion equal to loving Yah devotion if you love me you will keep my commandments the one who has my commandments and keeps them that one is the one who loves me and the one who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and will reveal myself to him. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and we will take up residence with him. The one who does not love me does not keep my words and the word that you hear is not mine but the father's who sent me. But so that the world may know that I love the Father, and just as the Father has commanded me, thus I am doing. Get up, let us go from here. So, loving Yeshua leads to Yeshua loving you back and revealing himself to you. Loving Yeshua leads to Father loving you back and dwelling within you. Yeshua himself follows Father's commandments to him, so even Yeshua is obedient to the Father. This flows perfectly with this week's portion from Deuteronomy 13, 3 through 4. You must not listen to the words that the prophet or to the dreamer, for Yahweh your God is testing you to know whether you love Yahweh your God with all of your heart and with all of your inner self. You shall go, you shall walk after Yahweh your God, and him you shall revere, and his commandment you shall keep, and to his voice you shall listen, and him you shall serve, and to him you shall hold fast. So as you can see, Yeshua is just saying what Moses told us in Deuteronomy. And he is embodying the message of Moses by himself being obedient to Father. Keeping Yeshua commandments is equal following Father's words obedience equal having your devotion and i will ask the father and he will give you another advocate in order that he may be with you forever the spirit of truth whom the world is not able to receive because it does not see him or know him you know him because he resides with you and will be in you but the advocate the holy spirit whom the father will send in my name that one will teach you all things and will remind you of everything that I said to you. So my question is, is the Father giving the Advocate to the Apostles only or to all of Yeshua's disciples in this verse? Who exactly is going to be with us forever, the Advocate or the Father? Or the Spirit of Truth and the Holy Spirit one and the same? Those are just some questions that came to me when I read these verses. 
The last thing is emphasis on the disciples heeding to the words Yeshua spoke to them while being physically present with them. So he says, these things I have spoken to you while residing with you. I will no longer speak much with you, for the ruler of the world is coming and he has no power over me. Is this a warning for us to focus and follow his direct messages rather than interpretation and discourses of third parties that haven't spent time with him in person? I don't know, that's how it sounds to me and some of you might even know who I'm referring to. And the last thought that I had was verse 27, Peace I live with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives I give to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. So for me faith is equal inner peace, equal untroubled, untroubled hearts. It's pretty much the other side of anxiety and being in the health industry I can tell you that many people suffer from anxiety nowadays and anxiety is just the other side of faith it's either or last thing was them is he sure referring to the hearts of the apostles or to the down the line disciples so when he said, do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. Did he mean the hearts be afraid or the disciples down the line? Those were all my thoughts. All right, and I'll add that I just dropped in the chat room there uh, more or less another view of John chapter 14, verses 16 to 17. And I'll read 17. And I will pray unto the Father, and he will give you another Ruach, holy for he will safeguard you forever, the Ruach of Truth, which the world is not able to take from you, because it does not see it and does not know it. But you do recognize it, because it is in you now, and it will continue to be in you. And this ties back into the whole Torah portion that we are reading about the truth, about what is truth, and seeking the truth, doing what is true. And here, having the Ruach of Truth within you. Now, this can be argued that this is not the Ruach HaKodesh, but another spirit, a spirit of truth. So I'm open to that, uh, that thought of having that spirit uh, as a separate one. And it ties in with Psalms 51, 10 through 12. Create me a clean heart, O Elohim, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. And do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your... Holy Spirit from me, restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. So I think uh, that is open up for debate, but my key, the key point I wanted to mention is that Ruach of Truth. Once again, it is another tie-in for the truth, walking the truth, the Torah, etc. And lastly, I just follow up with another one I dropped in the chat, and that was regarding John chapter 14, verse 15. If you love me, you will do my commands. And John 15.10, If you guard my commands, you shall stay in my love, even as I have guarded my Father's commands and stayed in his love. So I, got, I tied in many more verses that, that support that. that are all written in John and 1 John. So take a look at that and uh, share that with others. And then on the last page of the PDF, we included the variant meters or tickers that we created because we are going to keep tabs of the differences, the variance between the DSS and the Masoretic text, the DSS LXX and LXS to Masoretic. So at the end of the cycle, we are going to add up all of them <laughs> and come up with some numbers. But right now you can see on a weekly basis, you will be able to see the variants. I also included a few notes regarding the DSS. But as I said, we will create a more elaborate presentation and do it outside of our Wednesday cycle just to share all the knowledge that we are right now learning and acquiring in our research of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Thank you to all of you for joining us tonight. This was 
wonderful and we can't wait to open the floor and have a live discussion with you. Thank you all and look Thank forward you. to studying next week. We'll open up the floor for comments here.